Jean-Claude's answers to Sally's question there actually set us up beautifully for the next panel session, which is why I wanted to stop at that point. Could I ask our panelists to come up onto the, um, onto the platform now? There should be five of you. Right, thank you. We're going to our next session now, which is our, our, our panelists. Um, Dame Janet Finch commented that, 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 that the one thing that she got out of chairing the Finch Committee was that she's become a noun. Um, uh, and uh, she's yet to become a verb. We look forward to that. Um, <laughs> but... Um, uh, um, we do have the panel now to, to, to build on that. And I thought Jean-Claude's answer to, the, to Sally's question at the end there really did introduce uh, very nicely the, uh, the theme on this. Now, in the, in, in the spirit of uh, Jean-Claude's suggestion that we should um, upend the author, uh, I'm not going to do the usual thing of introducing them. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So I'm going to ask them just to, first of all, say uh, very quickly who they are and then give us one or two words as to why they think they're here. Um, uh, and that should be very brief, because then what we'll do is go to five minutes for everybody to speak to their topic, because I want to allow a, a maximum number of time, amount of time before lunch for interaction from the floor. So if we could start from the far end, and if you could just quickly say who you are and why you think you were asked to be here. <laughs> so my, my name is Karl Buhr. I'm working in Brussels uh, at the European Commission uh, with uh, Vice President Neely Cruz of the Commission, who is responsible for the digital, digital agenda and for ICT-related research funding in Europe. And as we have heard this morning already a lot, a um, big part of the reason we are here is, is the digital revolution and the technologies that we're seeing. We're in the business of, of producing more of that, and that's why we're also in the business of trying to benefit from it, and open access obviously is one of the big potential areas for, uh, for benefiting from it. And I guess I'm, I'm here because I've been very much involved with the policy development of the policy uh, statement issued by the Commission last year regarding open access uh, to scientific information. The Commission has set out its own uh, approach to open access when it comes to its own role as a research funder. You know, the Commission is a, a very large research funder in Europe. It's a new program, over 70 billion from 2014 to 2020, which will be covered by an open access requirement. Uh, and also a recommendation to member states as to our uh, conviction that they should think about these questions too, essentially do, um, not necessarily in the same way, but in similar ways as was done in the UK with the Finch group, to have a thought about what, uh, what this all implies and what should be done about this, so develop open access policies, requirements, and so mm -hmm. on. So uh, I was very close to that. I continue to be close to that, and I guess that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sally? Uh, my name is Sally Hardy. I'm the chief executive of the Regional Studies Association, not a commercial publisher, I, I <laughs> add now. Um, I've spoken quite a bit at conferences recently about open access in relation to journal publishing and how that will impact on learned societies and what the potential um, consequences are for learned societies in terms of our, our, the way in which we add to research ecology. And I think I've been invited here to broaden that reflection and to take into account open access monographs, what difference might that make, where can the learned societies make a difference, both in our work with our commercial publishing partners, but also with our members and the wider community. And I hope in my uh, five minute statement that I'll be able to make some reflections on where I think the learned societies might begin to make those contributions and why I think we've been quite slow to engage in that process. It, it was quite telling for me. I think there's only five people on the list of participants that own up to being from a learned society. Of course, others of you may be masquerading under your institutional affiliations. Thank you. Thank you. Kim. I'm Kim Hackett. I'm from the Higher Education uh, Funding Council for England. Um, and I'm here today, I think, uh, well, firstly, in place of David Sweeney, who wasn't able to attend, um, but mainly because HEFCI at the moment are, um, are currently developing our policy intentions regarding open access and the next research excellent framework. Uh, not the current REF that's happening at the moment, but the one thereafter. Um, so we've been consulting and working dialogue with the sector on how um, we can introduce that requirement and um, really to, to say a bit about how monographs fit into that today. 
Thank you. So I'm, I'm Rupert Gatti. I'm an economist up at uh, Trinity College. Uh, and, but the reason I'm here, I think, is because uh, with a group of other academics up there, we started up an open access publishing company, Open Book Publishers, um, pretty much because we agree with absolutely everything that the previous <laughs> speaker said. And we were frustrated by moaning to ourselves about it and, and frustrated with the existing publishing uh, environment that was just denying the developments that were, were possible in humanities and social sciences. So we thought, damn it, let's do it. So <laughs> that's what we've done. And I guess that's why I'm Thank here. You. Hi. I'm Philippe Grin. I have been asked to provide an author's perspective on open access monographs in the social science and humanities. Well, in the line of a previous talk by Jean-Claude, I, I usually say more that I'm a writer than an author. And actually, in French, I, I even say I'm an écriveur, someone who does the act of writing, because we have such a stupid sacralization of the notion of écrivain and author that I try to move away from it. So I'm going to do what I have been asked to, to do. And basically, the main topic would be to try to convince you that if we, we want to build something that makes sense in terms of writing and publishing open access monograph, uh, we will face challenges that have nothing to do with the usual thing we consider as challenges, like uh, less public money or piracy or whatever. Right, thank you. Great introductions. Now, what I'm going to do is ask each of you to speak for just five minutes. Now, we have to do this in the right order, because otherwise you'll end up with the wrong slides. And I think that will mess up content a little bit too much for all of you, although it could be a challenge, of course, to speak to the wrong slides um, <laughs> in the spirit of what Jean-Claude said earlier. But let's not, let's, uh, let's not do that. Um, so, Rupert, that means you've got to start. Well, that's easy, because I don't I know you can come up here. <laughs> oh, I go up there. All right, OK. <clears throat> OK, thank you. You might have to prompt me five minutes. I tend to burble sometimes. So, uh, yeah, I didn't come in with any slides, but I, I think the issue, and I, it's very rare that I've had to come up and speak after somebody who so eloquently uh, said pretty much all that I wanted to say. You know, we are, we are in a stage where dissemination of knowledge is possible on a scale which was unimaginable even 30 years ago. And we're stuck in a system which was determined 30 years ago. And so we're, we're right at a point where we can transform the way that we, that we disseminate our knowledge, that we generate that our, our knowledge, that the, that the humanities and social sciences can interact and engage with society. And right now, you know, as, the, as, the, as the abstract for the whole conference said, we're, we're in a situation where monographs have gone from dissemination of 2,000 which sounds quite a lot when you look at it now at about 200. And, and, but 2,000 is, is still tiny, and you know, it's good when you've got to melt metal. But when you don't have to melt any metal, when you don't have to pack things on horses over mountains, when you can do it digitally, it's pathetic. And now we're in a situation where we can engage with the full globe, where we can disseminate any ideas that we do have good, bad, whatever, we can put them out there and get people to engage with them. We're, we're at, a, at a broader level, the humanities and social sciences are having to fight for this funding stream to prove our relevance. And how can we prove our relevance when our primary and most important output is being printed 200 times and being given access to maybe 500 people? And then we claim we're meaningful. It's, you know, it, we can't do that. And so, so we've got to sort of front up and say there is another way of doing it. We also are no longer restricted to paper. There are different ways of engaging and more important ways of engaging. And, and paper will remain, I'm sure, one important outlet. But there's lots of other ways as well. And so we can't get fixated in that. The, the, the final thing, if I've still got a couple of minutes, is that as, as was um, uh, stated previously, the dissemination process is a very small end point of the whole research process, but it's critical. I say to all my students, it's no good you knowing that unless you can tell people that's what knowledge is for. And, and right now, the bit where we tell people is bound up 
in a book, and it's constrained access by publishers through a payment system. And so, so we are paying for the dissemination process by putting money down to be a reader. And so we are paying by denying access to knowledge. And so I think we need to think all the time that whatever we're proposing, if, we're pay if we've got this payment to read model down, then we are saying, guess what, Africa? We're not interested. Guess what, everybody who's not un got an academic position? You'll never understand. And that's, that's not where we can and should be. So it's a real, real social da da damage that's being done, I think, by restricting ourselves to the book and by having a payment mechanism for the reader to access what the ideas that we're putting out. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Philippe. Hello. Uh, so I have been asked to be here basically because I do write open access monographs in the social science and the humanities, but I must first put a disclaimer. Uh, the three of them have been written after I left academia. And when I actually, when I was an academic researcher, I didn't feel any real surge to write monographs. And uh, that maybe tells something, that is, there are lots of things that do qualify content-wise, two of them were peer-reviewed classically, uh, that come from outside of the academia. So I would like to start by, sorry, by, uh, by a few hard facts. What I call hard facts are, are facts that won't disappear even when you hate them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I think basically the social science and humanities and are, they are just the same than any other domain in which people uh, uh, think about stuff, write stuff, and try to make it available to readers. And what is ex we experience is that with the birth of the information technology and the internet and the capability building it has made possible, there are more interesting people who are in a position to write stuff and make it available to others, much more than before. And even the, let's say, the filters that define uh, I, uh, monographs in the so social science and humanities, they are, they are not enough to prevent this fact from existing also there. Reading time or attention time in more generally is not increasing. Uh, and uh, even if access is made easier, uh, it, is, it is severely constrained. And the result is a simple consequence is that the average audience is strongly diminishing. Uh, you know, in the US, there are uh, five times more published titles of books per year than there were 20 years ago, and this will keep going. However, in that situation, some small audience or middle audience books matter, of course, it would be stupid to say that all of them matter, and we have a challenge in trying to, to, to make them acknowledge, to, to assist more of them to exist. So what I'm trying to do is to, to try to, to learn a bit from the experience of uh, my, my, my last book, uh, written with a contribution of my daughter, Suzanne, uh, who, who was published by Amsterdam University Press and distributed through uh, for the open access version by the OAPEN uh, platform. Uh, this is a book we published in four uh, with four channels, uh, a paper book, uh, both print run, and that's basically because I was a, there. I was a stupid author, and I think I, we could have gone only for for print on demand. But uh, uh, commercially books, and I will come back to that because they are the stupidest thing that I have uh, seen here in, in this domain. Uh, a free to share PDF and an augmented edition site. Here are the figures for, I mean, my books sort of live long, uh, 
which means they, they live slow also. <laughs> uh, and uh, so this is, this is an ongoing process. But basically, uh, you could see that about 500 copies uh, have, been, have been sold, uh, uh, which, let's say, by, by standards of this domain, uh, look like a middle rather than small. Uh, but uh, uh, 3,000 downloads have occurred on the open site which is amazingly low. So the first lesson is, if I do it myself, like I did for the second book, the one you saw before, uh, and I, I am myself promoting the downloads, I, I will have five times more downloads. So the first lesson is open access publishers, or publishers in general, they don't know how to promote uh, uh, access, free access on the internet. It's not easier to have many people access for free a book than it is to have many people access it uh, 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 by paying. Uh, but the other interesting thing is the augmented edition site of the book had 10,000 unique visitors and uh, which looks like a more interesting figure. Another interesting thing is uh, several of my books have been translated in several languages for one, and this is something which is incredibly encouraged by open access. None of these translations would have existed without open access. Uh, now, a few words before I leave the floor uh, uh, on the augmented edition. This is, in it, we have what you should find, actually, uh, I also run a company that does annotation tools and, and, and websites, collaborative websites. So we wanted that to be a kind of window uh, of our know-how. So basically, uh, you find all the software code that was used in the study, all the data sets. You can comment chapter by chapter. You see an example here. Uh, you can run interactive media. Uh, of the, the models, uh, interactive models on the site. Uh, and basically, what do you see is, well, of the 10,000 unique visitors, uh, about only 5% five, uh, uh, 5 will, will invest in the real interactive uh, facilities, that is, uh, data sets, uh, source code, and uh, uh, which goes back to the number of people who were seriously interested in, the, in reading the book. Uh, I, uh, the most innovative aspect is uh, maybe the running of the interactive models, because it's really uh, developing a new, new, uh, uh, a new involved relationship of readers in, in the substance of uh, what is told in the book. Uh, we, we were very much uh, stimulated by an example of a book on fiscal uh, reform and fiscal policy uh, yeah. by uh, Thomas Piketty, Camille uh, Le Saez, and uh, Landais. Uh, and uh, uh, give a look if you have time. And thanks for your attention. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Um, as I already mentioned, the Commission has a double role as a research funder and as a research policymaker. And uh, speaking as a research funder first, uh, I can report that uh, in Horizon 2020, which is the next framework program for research uh, of the European Union, there will be, depending on how you count, between uh, 700 million and 1.5, 1.6 billion for uh, the humanities and social science research funding for seven years. So it's roughly 200 million a year. That's a substantial pot of money, and obviously, as I mentioned already, we are looking for open access to the results of that funding. Now, the Commission is rather agnostic when it comes to what the results are, and so it's, it's not really in contradiction necessarily with what Jean-Claude uh, explained this morning. So I think we'd be very open if people came with new ways of doing that, but obviously, uh, this, is a, this is a program that is based on paying out the money to those who do the research. And if those who do the research decide that they need to write books or papers or journal articles, they are going to, to do that. And we are there uh, to, first of all, tell them that you would like to see the results in open access. We are also there uh, to tell them how to do open access. And for those who haven't followed this policy debate, mainly last year, a little bit in the, say, interaction between uh, 
the Finch discussion, to use it as a noun again, uh, and uh, our policy announcement in July, which came slightly afterwards. Um, our position uh, in that is, is, let's say, a balanced one. The Commission always wants to be balanced. For those of you who have ever visited a policy event, you, you have heard this term before. Uh, we are basically in the middle. We have said uh, that we are very much in favor of uh, green. We like uh, self-repository uh, of authors. However, we are not against gold. So if people want to do that, they can do it. And they can even uh, get the money reimbursed uh, inside the project uh, funding that they have. Now, it was, I was interested in, in the beginning about John Clos's uh, uh, discussion about the collaboration aspect and uh, the, this, this, uh, this argument that we need to get away perhaps more than we have in the past from the single author. Obviously, the European research programs, they are about collaboration. They're actually about forced collaboration because you need partners from several countries in these projects. And so often uh, there is already the first question that they have, and how do, how, how do they bring together the, the results? And this brings me to another problem uh, in the end. So you have project reports, you have outcomes of this, and of course you have individual researchers or groups of researchers publishing about the results. You may also have the odd or not so odd PhD student working away on their thesis uh, as part of, of such a funded project, which then comes much later. And obviously we want to have all of the outcomes uh, covered by the open access uh, mandate that is going to be there, uh, which raises the question of what to do when projects are over. What about this funding element? Because we really want to be balanced on this. We won't, don't want to just say, well, we are green and gold, but by the way, now your project is over, so there is no money uh, anymore. And so uh, to give you a state of play currently, we are studying the way, the possibilities of how to do that without, however, going as far as uh, I think some announcements in the UK have thought us the UK would go, uh, namely of, of somehow saying that every comer will have money for, for what, what's going to be done there. It's obvious that uh, this, this amount of money is not available and is especially not known today and if not, it's not known, it cannot be budgeted for and therefore by definition it's not available. But we are working uh, very actively on setting up uh, such, such an instrument that will, would allow to catch uh, those cases where really the outcome comes after the project is formally over but we really want the results not to end up in some you know, closed publishing uh, setting, but we want to, them to be available too. Uh, and to allow that, we want to be uh, have, having set up a flexible uh, system. Two other elements, perhaps interesting also in light of what Martin said earlier about the stuff and the data and the, the different kinds of things that we have. We're also looking not only at publications and be they modern or more old-fashioned types of publications, uh, but also data, uh, so research data, the underlying uh, information on which the, the results are, are based. And uh, there we are setting up something we should call the data pilot, and basically the idea is here to make sure that we uh, go into the direction of open access to the data too, mm -hmm. however, in a less, let's say, forcing way with uh, publications. We have already run a pilot, as some of you may know, uh, since 2008, we think we have enough experience to now conclude that it's time to go to an open access mandate, whereas for data, it's a bit more early days still. Uh, right now, I think tomorrow in Brussels, uh, there will be a, a hearing about this just to uh, explore with the communities of um, uh, exploring the various uh, interests and uh, concerns about how such a data pilot could run. Obviously, our hunch and Vice President Cruz's approach to this is, of course, the more, the better. And what you may also know that we're in the business of building the infrastructures that will, will allow the data to be there, to be stored, and actually to be accessed. This is more about more than about just build, uh, buying cheap storage. This is about building the systems that allow you to actually work with this data, to curate it, to keep it alive and uh, useful. Um, Final word then on the monograph in the human, uh, humanities and social sciences, as you may have already gathered from what I've said up to now, we have no, made no special amends for monograph, non-monograph. In principle, the same rules will apply. Obviously, the question will, will then come up, how are the costs uh, you know, allocated between the two types or very different types of uh, publications. How can these things be planned before? Normally it takes, we have heard it a few times already, it takes longer to write a book, so maybe you're in a, a larger risk to be behind uh, a project uh, schedule and to be too late in a way. We already discussed this morning a bit possible ways to amend that where you basically decide before that you write a book, you commit the money, uh, we would be happy, our, our money would flow, our auditors would be happy, but in the end you could still uh, finalize the manuscript a year or two or three years after uh, the projects are over. That may be one possibility. As I said, we are studying others. Uh, but necessarily, uh, we don't really see a difference between this area and others, and there I want to uh, echo what Rupert said earlier. In a way, 
this is research publicly funded, the results should be accessible, and obviously uh, when you then go down to the, to the details, there may be differences in, in the way the communities approach this, but from the res uh, research funders' perspective, we don't see the need to make any special arrangements for that, apart from the embargo period for, for self-depositing, where we have allowed uh, for 12 months instead of six uh, for these areas, which I think also has seen some examples elsewhere. And with that, I spoke 90 seconds too long. <laughs> I hope you can forgive me. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to talk about how learned societies will support monograph authors as they transition to open access. And when I was preparing, I found it quite difficult to engage with partly because it's difficult to speak on behalf of the learned societies because we're really not very homogenous. Um, but I'll give it, give it to you from my perspective. Um, the second reason is that not many of my chief exec officer colleagues have engaged with this fully yet. We've been very slow to do this. So with those two caveats, I'm going to share my thoughts. Um, let me put books in perspective for you from a regional studies association uh, point of view. Our annual income is around a million pounds. Of that, books, in terms of um, editorial expenses and royalties, come in at 4,000 pounds. That's 0.5% of our income comes from books. By contrast, our journals programme contributes 507,000, at 51%, 51%. And I think the RSA case is not untypical. Now, is that good enough? No, of course, of course it isn't. Um, our book series is important to us. We publish with Routledge. Um, it's growing. We have more manuscripts coming in. There's clearly an appetite to both, to both write them. And in our series, sales are stable, um, growing in some areas on some of our paperback books. So what do we need to do as a society? I suppose I see three types of activity for us. Um, firstly, an advisory role where we inform our members about the changes and the implications that there might be for them. Um, the role of an advocate for, for, uh, for our members. And finally, I think there's a collective role for the learned societies where we might pose questions on issues that have, would have a more general resonance in the wider community. So I see a kind of three-stage thing. So first, I'm going to quickly talk about playing the role of an advocate for our members. Um, and in doing this, it will be important for learned societies to recognize that open access is not even across global territories. It's rolling out in slightly different ways around the world. Um, and our responses need to be nuanced. So if we look at three kind of themes, funding, pricing, and publishing formats, they seem, they seem core. So how will funding mechanisms work? How will funding be divided between journal APCs and book APCs? How will we be sure that our members get access to those funds in, in whatever kind of society we work? What about pricing? We're beginning to see offers come through now to the market. So Palgrave are offering £11,000, Springer, €15,000. Uh, Manchester University Press have come in at 5900 for up to 80,000 words, and then a, a sliding scale. Intech are charging by the chapter. There's, there's a multitude of different um, models. So from a, a learned society point of view, are those prices equitable? Do they apply across all disciplines? If not, what's the justification for that? Is it because of increased typesetting costs because of the type of content? I wonder whether we might be seeing the days of more expensive books in the area, areas like economics and business studies coming to an end. And, and I think that would be a very good thing. What about publishing formats? A number of models are appearing. Um, there are models where you make the plain HTML version that can't be printed at freely available, so that's your open access. And then you buy, you have the option to buy your hardback, your paperback, and your, your e-version or your PDF. Um, it's possible to buy premium e-books with enhanced um, navigation, search facilities, and multimedia content. But which model is best? Does there need to be a single best model? 
Perhaps there's an advantage in having a complex offer which allows authors to choose from a wide number of options that might suit their audiences better. Another area where we might support our members um, is through advising them on, on what's happening, developments with open access monograph publishing. In preparing, I was very struck, for example, on a different culture and attitude to licensing in the books world to the journals world. In books, CC BY seems to be promoted as a unilaterally good thing. If you look at the Palgrave and the Springer websites, CC BY is beautifully um, displayed as excellent. I mean, Jean-Claude, I'm sure, would totally agree with that. But we know from various surveys, and the OAPEN survey most recently, that many authors have reservations about that. They're worried about the, about the way in which their content might be used. And they do feel a sense of ownership and wanting to protect that. Um, I think the associations have a role and a responsibility to their members in getting these issues out and making sure that they know what, what these licenses are, what they mean, what the implications are. For example, on the Palgrave site, they quite openly say that if you're going to publish your book CCBY, please don't plan to include third-party materials because it's A, likely to cost you a lot more money, or B, you're not going to get permission for it. What kind of world is that that we're living in? We really need to make sure that our constituent members understand these issues. Finally, um, I imagine um, that as, the, as with uh, open access journals, um, there will be a, a kind of engagement by the learned societies in, in the debate. And what I would like to see is quite a number of issues being raised by the societies which will have this broader resonance where we can engage in, in discussions with um, academics, with the commercial publishers and, and with the funders. And quite a number of issues immediately spring to mind. So green or gold? open access publishing for monographs. There's a real push to gold, but does it have to be that way? And if it's green, what's an appropriate embargo? And does that vary by subject area? Not all publishers are offering discounts to developing countries. Springer is because it's funded externally, but Palgrave isn't, and they're completely open about that on their website. How do we feel about that as a community? <laughs> How do we ensure a publishing environment which avoids a breakout of predatory publishers? And I refer you to Beale's list here of predatory publishers. We know that there are publishers that would sacrifice quality just for the money. What about peer review? Absolutely critical question for the learned societies, I suggest. Um, do we need a debate about new forms of peer review? Or are we confident in our existing systems? Mm. If we use sales as a proxy for quality at the moment, will publishers be able to upgrade their portals in order to allow the measurement of downloads and page views? We know it's being done in some of the pilot projects at the moment. But if so, for the smaller publishers, how will they fund that? What about marketing? This was raised earlier. Access is one thing, but readership's something else. Now, the, I think the OAPEN um, results show that if you do make monographs open access, there are more downloads and, and views. But how, how do we know that? When, when there's, what will be the incentive for marketing in a world where the publishers have all the money up front? And is it right that we push all of that back onto the academics? That's not their primary purpose. How will membership schemes work, and will they be ethical? What about VAT? That will have a big impact. Not very interesting. I can't stand VAT myself. I find it very confusing. But it is an important issue in open access publishing and online publishing. Finally, can the publishers make this model work and will it be sustainable? And what will happen to incomes to organizations like the Learned Societies? Journals income is absolutely critical for my society, but anything that damages the societies will have an impact down the line on research ecology. So I think I've raised more questions than I've answered. Um, the move to open access publishing has gone with dazzling speed and, and not a little controversy um, in journals. In open access monographs, it's been almost silent from my perspective, but the societies really do need to engage, not only in terms of our advocacy and advice roles, but also practically. 
could I make our, our older publications open access? How would I go about doing that? How would that be funded? It seems to me this conference is very timely in raising a number of very, very important issues for the societies. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm going to start off just by um, giving an overview of uh, our view of the benefits of open access generally, which underpin our policy objective. And they are, as is well known, effic increased efficiency in the research process um, in having research findings freely available and accessible online with all the potential for text and data mining tools uh, developing and for public understanding in being able to freely access um, publicly funded research findings. So, um, as a council, we want those benefits to apply to research in all disciplines and for open access, therefore, extend to all output types for which it's reasonably achievable um, for, for to do so. Furthermore, um, sharing some of the, the ideas already discussed today, we share the view that open access for monographs actually offers an opportunity um, to develop a sustainable model and also for it to respond to the changing environment of scholarly communications. Um, so, um, following on from that, it's our policy objective to encourage the increased, uh, an increased proportion of research outputs to be published in open access form. Um, so, to achieve that, um, we've announced an intention to um, introduce an open access requirement into the next research excellence framework after the 2014 exercise, and that's the UK-wide um, research assessment uh, on which we base our allocation of funding. Uh, so we set out our initial thoughts on, on how we'd introduce this requirement in a, in a letter in February and sought advice on that, on those initial thoughts. And it's that advice that I wanted to discuss with you today, really, and in particular, the advice that we received on monographs. Um, we think this advice offers quite a significant resource to us at the moment in terms of the increasing our understanding on the feasibility of, of open access and to get a sense of the different perspectives that exist in the sector at the moment and the varying concerns that are held by different groups. And what the advice did show and demonstrate was a widespread uh, support for the principles of open access, which I, I don't think many people disagree with. With regard to monographs, um, the advice underlined um, the value of monographs for research in the humanities and social sciences. And that's something that's been a little bit questioned today, but it's certainly something that came through strongly in the advice that we received. Um, but advice also echoing what we've heard about concerns about the current model um, for publishing monographs. It was described as being broken and offering low economic return. Therefore, a number of respondents expressed the view that there's a need for a sustainable open access model, um, often with a view that, that Hefke should encourage and support <laughs> developing work on this. But similarly, um, there were concerns that the developing models would need to ensure that the UK reputation for research in these disciplines is maintained um, through the high standards, through keeping the high standards of peer review and editing <coughs> that currently underpin the quality of research in these output types. But that reflects a more widely held concern um, in, in the advice relating to the timing of our policy intentions and the stage of development of open access monograph models. A number of respondents did um, highlight the number of new initiatives, often enthusiastically, with a great deal of optimism about their potential, which is great. But many also highlighted the quite early stage of some of these developments, suggesting that they're not going to be advanced enough to make open access for the post-2014 REF feasible even with an appropriate notice period before the requirement applied, and especially in view of the different publication times um, between monographs as compared with journals. So in summary, the ma majority view expressed was that it was at this stage not appropriate to introduce a requirement for open access for monographs into the next REF. The advice also highlighted the different range of positions from researchers, publishers, funders, and their specific concerns and issues which we'll need to address going forward and gather evidence where possible to inform further policy development. So just to summarize the next steps for what we're doing, we sought that advice to feed into the development of a formal consultation on open access in the next REF, and that consultation is due to be launched in a few weeks' time. 
in developing those proposals, we have taken account of the advice that we received, at including on those outputs for which it's appropriate to expect open access publication. So for monographs in the meantime, as mentioned, it's clear that there are a number of views and concerns to address supported by a number of calls for further work to be done. And, and we don't have the answers at this stage to address those concerns that have been raised in the responses and more widely. Um, but we think it's important now that we all work together to gather the evidence on monograph publishing, explore the future of workable, sustainable models that will maintain the high standards and increase accessibility. So we're just at the very beginning stages of some work that we're hoping to take forward in partnership with other funders to gather evidence and explore the possibilities working with key representatives from the, from the different interested groups. So we're looking forward to exploring these issues and will, of course, report on these in due course. Thank you to all our panellists. Um, it's now open for um, um, a, a comments and points from the floor. And what I'd like you to do, if you, if you just introduce yourself um, and keep the, the, the comments or questions relatively brief because we haven't got that much time. And then I'll ask members of the panel to respond. So who'd like to, um, who'd like to start off? <clears throat> yes, yes. Have we got hand? Did I see somebody? Yes. Where? OK, at the back. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> got a light in my eye here. Please go ahead. Uh, and also because it clearly raises so many practical problems. But one of the ideas that I've heard floating around about Green is that learned societies might be a better place to, for the repositories to be than the repositories that currently exist in HEIs. Um, partly because then it would be much easier and more obvious mm -hmm. to go to the subject concerned. Um, now then, of course, there would be a funding problem, and I think the funding problem is one that we might encourage HEFSI and other people to be thinking about. Thank you. Well, let's start with you, Sally, on that then, because it starts in with learned societies and green. Yes. Um, it's a very interesting question, and I, and I would very much like to explore um, green book publishing as well. The commercial publishers seem to have moved firmly down the gold route, um, and that's for very understandable reasons. Um, there isn't very much to be read on green, but there is some material if you look closely for it. Um, embargoes would be a serious issue there. How long, how long do you embargo a book for? Um, I think that would be quite tricky. Um, your point on repositories um, is, is very interesting um, and a little bit scary because running a repository is an absolutely non-trivial task. Um, I, I really don't think that it would be realistic for many humanities and social science learned societies to engage in that, even with additional funding. Um, and uh, I really think that, yeah, I, I, I struggle to see how my organisation would manage to mm. run a, a repository in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that would make it helpful to the global research community, if, if I'm honest. Thanks, Sally. Other comments on Green? Go ahead. Pretty. Uh, yeah, I had some experience with... Uh, Let's say my first book, with, uh, which was published by Fayard, it's a subsidiary of the Lagarde Shed books, uh, there was a six-month embargo, and it was sort of kind of green uh, model uh, because I was, on, I was allowed to, to distribute it uh, on a designated site, though it was under a, co a Creative Commons license, which mean, meant it went everywhere after. Uh, and... The main lesson I learned is, uh, you know, from uh, the angle of synergy between uh, access to the uh, open access version and sales, the, the proper embargo duration is zero, uh, which means that the, 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 let's say the distinction between green and gold in, in uh, the domain of books, I think is uh, uh, probably a mistaken one. 
in the sense that uh, if you have an embargo of zero, it means, uh, yeah, well, the only question is who takes responsibility for distributing the open access version. But I'm pretty sure that's not how most publishers would see it because they have internalized the idea that people don't buy stuff that they can get for free, even if it's not the same thing. And as a result, they will ask for longer and longer embargoes. And so my, my suggestion would be uh, uh, maybe to, to forget about this distinction. I mean, it's, it has mm. spared monographs up to now. Uh, so maybe we should keep it like that. Thank you. Show that um, sales were unaffected yeah. um, when 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 books were made um, for open access. Okay, thank you. Another question, Jean Claude, front. Yeah, in the in the same line, I think the discussion that's going on right now is still very much stuck on the idea that there is a, a fixed monograph. Mm -hmm. uh, even if we take the monograph as the end product of, of a certain process. Uh, maybe there would be a role for learned societies as well in helping promote the manuscripts pre, uh, ahead of things, mm -hmm. promoting the communities around these manuscripts, and working in terms of repositories, working with the libraries. I, I think there's a natural fit there. And, uh, and then when, the, when the, the manuscript reaches some sort of viable plateau, intellectually speaking, uh, then something like a publication could take place which would not necessarily stop the evolution of that text, but would show that this is, let's say, a long-term service document that can be uh, perhaps commercialized, sold, whatever. But yeah. then we go into a different realm. Mm -hmm. And we have a dis n neat distinction between the intellectual effort and the economic sphere. Thanks. Rupert, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I just I agree wholeheartedly. I, th I think one of the one of the problems that we've got is, is the debate is exactly this rigidity. And I, I think the green gold, um, the issue of the of of an embargo period is is really critical here. If you're going to realise the potential of open access, I mean, it's not even the potential of open access. Open access is a piece in a puzzle of digital dissemination. It's a really mm. critical piece, but it's only a piece. And you can't disseminate knowledge. You can't do, you can't realise the potential of digital dissemination without having the text available for people to interact with. And so an embargo period of anything is a nonsense because you're, you're denying the very process of dissemination which is so critical to where we should be going. So this green-gold distinction, I, th I think, is damaging because it forces one back into a fixed package and that this thing comes out as a fait accompli, something that's there with a full stop and a bound cover on it. And that's what we call gold. And we put it somewhere else and call green. I think there is a real role for institutional repositories in exactly the same way, that there's a process there that is, is capable of... of, of of, of storing uh, the disseminated work of an institution or a university. And there's real roles for, for academic societies in, in, in being people to, uh, to help facilitate identification and encouragement of good research and putting it up there. I really, really, really pull my hair out at academic societies that say, I rely on the money. I, I, that, that, you know, the role of the societies, I, I'm not sure <laughs> when the role of the societies stepped in to be a union representative for its participants. <laughs> it, it used to be about disseminating knowledge, about putting it out there and letting society access it. And I think we can really focus that and bring it down and bring the societies back right. to play a central role in that. Thank you. Now, Sally wants to respond to that, but I'm not... <laughs> I'm... Um, I, I, I. <laughs> but, but, but I'm not going to let her. Um, <laughs> Because, Carl, you gave us, uh, initially, I'm not going to let her, I won't be able to stop her eventually, but, but um, Carl, you gave us some very, very large numbers at the beginning that you're going to give us all through European Union funding, Framework 7. So how are you going to match your, and, and Kim, how are you going to match your funding models to something that everybody seems to think is a good thing? How can you make your funding models, make, make it possible for the sort of vision uh, that, uh, that Rupert's talking about there? Well, I mean, f first a clarification. The reason we are talking about green is not uh, about embargoes in the context of green. It's not that we want this text to stay closed for six months or 12. Obviously not. I mean, this, this you have to see in the context of the research funder going out and telling the recipients of the money what they can do. And you can imagine that right now, 
everybody knows the figures, they're not very large of spontaneous, uh, you know, making open access of research publications by the authors. That's the only reason we're talking about uh, mandates now. And going from zero, basically, to 100 and saying everything needs to be open on day one is not just, you know, people will, will say, well, it's great because that's the only way that makes sense. That was a little bit what Rupert said. But they will, even with 12 months and six months, we had a lot of uh, <clears throat> debate in Brussels, not to call it lobbying, uh, around this. And I think it makes sense if you if you talk about a transition system, because you, there will be pub researchers. They, somebody called them conservative earlier, especially the, the, the young ones. And you cannot just ignore all of mm. that. They are there. They are all in the process of already writing something and then tell them, well, it needs to be open from day one. So forget about all of those journals who now, and not only, you know, not without impact maybe from the UK debate, have now chosen to, uh, to demand uh, embargo periods that are longer than 12 months you, or, or longer than six months. You just tell them, sorry, forget about this publication uh, opportunities. That, that's what we don't want. So we want to leave it a door open there to, to be reasonable, to make, make it possible for people to get both, to be mm. a, 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 available in open access and publish in the journal of the dream, if they can call it like that, in the best possible one that they can get into. Leaving alone the whole debate about whether there should be such a thing as a good and a bad journal and whether that is the past or not the future. But you see, in a way, a research fund is also a conservative <coughs> place because it's about putting money out for something that politicians have decided is important. And so you cannot then stop putting out all of that and say, uh, well, I don't believe in the journal anymore, because then, then you just become irrelevant. And so maybe this situates a bit uh, the, this mm -hmm. discussion. One last uh, comment, if I may, on this. Um, there are some people that explain in very convincing terms to authors that basically nobody and no, nothing and nobody can stop them from making their results available on day one for free for everyone. So I like this idea. I like people doing that. But there are only so many instruments you have to actually make, take this tool and actually do it. And so that's the reason why we mention embargo without meaning that they have to keep it closed. Far from it. Thank you. Now, before coming back to Sally, uh, Kim, w w in, would you say that one of the reasons why in your consultation uh, 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 the people you consulted were unenthusiastic about moving to... Um, open access for monographs for the next ref is because they were thinking in their minds, where am I going to find £10,000? Um, not so clearly. I think that's part of the reason. Um, and certainly um, from the humanities and social sciences, that is a concern for open access more generally, I think, um, not just for monographs. Um, but uh, mainly because th there, doesn't, there wasn't confidence that there had been a, a workable model demonstrated yet. Um, through which they'd, okay. they'd be able to meet the requirement. Well, thank you. It, that's really gratifying that people in the academic community think that there's no problem with finding £10,000 and are only, in fact, <laughs> limited uh, by the, their concerns about the business model. Um, so, so, Sally, all of your members have no problem with finding £10,000 but are concerned about the business model. Is that fair? Well, I'm going to come back to Rupert's comments directly. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would. I knew you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Perhaps I slightly misrepresented our position, or perhaps you've um, chosen to um, poke a little, little, little mischief at us. Um, I, I do feel obliged to defend the role of societies. Um, we very much are about building communities in the way that Jean-Claude suggested. So where are many academic papers first showcased? They're showcased either within research networks or at conferences and events that are organised by the academic societies. Where is a lot of that research then built and grown? It's through our newsletters and our magazines and then into our journals. So, of course, we do play absolutely pivotal role in the development of knowledge and the exchange of knowledge. Um, we're also engaged in the generation of new knowledge through our research funding programs. And many learned societies have small but important research funding programs. We fund um, £160,000 worth of early career grants in £10,000 slots. Um, so we are actively engaged in that. Um, and critically, we have a very large um, knowledge exchange activity, which sees us running research-led seminars within the Palace of Westminster at least once and often very many more times a year. We're the partners for the Open Days for DG Regio, looking at regional policy across Europe, working with practitioners and policy makers, where it's the academics that are showcasing their work. Now, this is part of what the, the learned societies do around the growth of knowledge and the exchange of knowledge, which, is, which I, I'm sure you agree 
um, is terribly important, and that does need to be funded. So if a part of what I'm doing is saying, let's make sure that in the development of open access monographs, we, we build models that are um, economically sustainable, then a little bit of me is not ashamed of that, because we believe in the quality of the work that we do, and that work does need to be funded in some way. Thank you. Philippe. Anything from you? No, just, just an additional point. If uh, I, I couldn't agree more with what Jean-Claude has said and Rupert and, and other people about the importance of having a platform which is also some form of production and post-publishing production of uh, future work. And, but that only increases the challenges of uh, finding funding. Uh, this is, uh, it's clear, but uh, let's say uh, uh, today there are very few projects that can have few MIT books in the natural science and the two examples I mentioned, mine and, and Piketty's book, that can afford putting that in place. And they do it by mobilizing uh, resources that are not generalizable. So I think really if I have uh, uh, a message to uh, my former uh, let's say not my former colleague, but the, the colleague of the organization for which I used to work is uh, do consider the uh, uh, financing of putting in place these platforms, open access based, but uh, with additional, uh, uh, with really real innovation in functionality and sharing of the platforms between people, because this is really a work we cannot afford. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there would be many flavors of it, but we cannot afford to have each small publisher developing this. They won't succeed in it. And uh, so uh, you have some big experiments. I, I know Lucy Montgomery is here. Maybe she will speak a bit about what's happening in China, on which she has supervised great work. In China, you have, you have grassroots efforts that have made big efforts at developing these uh, new forms of platform for post-publishing reviews, for, for uh, bettering the content after. This is, uh, this is the process we are going to see also with players like PLJ, or, or, but uh, it mm. should be, uh, that's where our, let's say, public policy and society efforts should, should target their, their uh, low means. Thank you. We're out of time. Could you thank um, the panel very much uh, for their <laughs> one conversation?